you know, it, it not only was it a fantastic week, but I, I will tell you that I would rather travel outside my immediate area. When I was in Austin in Facility Fusion, I was able to 100% immerse oh. in it. Here, you know, it, yeah, people keep uh, pulling you back, if you will. So I, <laughs> Kate, I, I mean, you to be out I, of town. yeah, Robbie, <laughs> you can relate. It's a lot. If you go out of town, then all of a sudden we still are in that mindset. Oh, well, he's, he's in Austin. Uh, she's in Denver. So, you know, we can, we'll have to work this without them. Otherwise, I'm getting, you know, I'm sure all everyone else that was local had a lot of those extra notes too. Hey, can you, how should I word this? Can you put this together for me? Because, you know, you're physically right around the corner. So they assume that you're, hmm. uh, you're plugged in. So, but you know, what an amazing conference. Jamal, we're <sighs> kicking it off and you're muted because you got some background uh, uh, transit noise. Uh, this is number 148. I can't believe it, that it keeps on rolling. Doing it live a few days ago <laughs> was an absolute blast. Uh, uh, Kate Nord, mm -hmm. Pat Turnbull playing critical roles. Otherwise, Jamal and I would have pulled it off. Jamal sat down right next to Lenny and said, hey, I'm going <laughs> to longing table for uh for the next uh, three hours. And then I got to act like a cartoon character trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> how how can we silence the room because they've been just talking uh, uh, passionately at these 11 individual tables and, you know, they can't stop talking for the, for the shout outs. They did a little bit, but, you know, there was, there was a, the, the ears are still humming here. I don't know about the rest of you, but that was fantastic. Well, we're in the pit. It's, Everyone's been here at least several times, and that excites me. Uh, to see Anthony Lee, who we were going to have come in at the, the mosh pit, but we ran out of uh, uh, minutes. But he was gracious enough to say, if you need me, I'll come there and give an inspirational three minutes of how you can show up at the table and be part mm -hmm. of the conversation. And what we're seeing from the early notes, Anthony, is... Uh, you'd be really very proud of people. We had some folks that have really are, you know, from the city of Austin, uh, uh, out from the Tri-Valley public uh, uh, roles, and they stepped right up and were not intimidated at all. And then we just heard off camera a second ago from Kate North that uh, FM more than they ever have has really embraced the front of the house. The idea of, you know, do I work towards and someday could be the chief of workplace. And I don't know what the, the metrics are, but there's probably there's <laughs> probably one or two chief of workplaces in the Fortune 1000. We know that's dramatic uh, change. With that said, welcome to the pit, everyone. Our whole idea is not just to go deep on the mosh pit, uh, but other things that we, those of us that were in San Francisco, and it looks like we have about 50% that were, that are here to share a takeaway or two. Uh, yes, I'm looking around the room. Rafi, I'm just going to, uh, well, you know, Kate, you're on mic already. And why don't we get into the one formal part? You, you did a great uh, Mentimeter and we used it not just to, uh, you know, influence, we used it to get people to contribute who they are, what they're interested in. Can we uh, do a 60 second run through on that? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And it's just such a good tool because you know everybody can contribute to it. It's completely anonymous, but this gives you a little bit of a feel who showed up. Again, you know, we had more facility managers in real estate. And I think that was, you know, a lot of that came from the mosh pit, but also the workplace strategy and experience some good tech. This was also in conjunction with the IT community at IFMA. So IT is similar to the workplace evolutionaries is that it goes across all components. Um, and then we had some good uh, folks like HOK and Gensler and a number of folks coming from the, the um, architectural and design side. And then we had, let me see if I can move this thing. Uh, when we asked them the question and we kind of tried to pull from the table, and the this, these tables are were similar to what we had prior in our previous session, but we changed them, especially with the inclusion of the IT community. We put in a couple more IT topics. 
Um, so we started this out, and David, I have regret that we didn't do it again after the session. Uh, but the first one, you know, is still all about people. It's about engagement. The second strategy is really analyzing their portfolio strategies. And I think we should have probably broaden that to workplace and portfolio strategies depending upon the size of the organization. But look at how close, you know, this adoption of digital transformation. We're going to get there. It's, it's a, just such a key role as well as the integration. So some silo busting here. Uh, but what was interesting for me personally is after the conversation and throughout the week conversations is that some of the topics that they just didn't know about, I think they would have voted differently. Like, for example, we had a couple of really great sessions around workplace circularity. That's not a, a and people don't know a lot about it right now. And so they may not, if they knew about it, and they, especially if they're involved with ESG reporting, that may have accelerated up further, but people came back to me and said, that was so cool. I learned all about this. And I learned a lot more about BIM and also digital twins, you know, things that are just perhaps not on their radar, but this is where we started with them. And then as we got into the session, um, let's see here, I'm going to just take you out of here a little bit and just squeeze down here. Um, I want to make sure you guys all had a chance. We kind of told them a little bit about this process that we go through, it's called the World Cafe. We, the workplace evolutionaries have used it over a dozen years. And it's a great way to get people to come to a table, have a great conversation, you know, heavily moderated, and then get up, move to another table. So that was the same process. And these were our wonderful. Um, Is that where the berets came from, Kate? No, the berets came from, they were the very beginning stage of we, because when we first started, we decided that, and Nancy Soundquist is on the call today, but we wanted to be able to have something that would symbolize the fact that we're here and we're not going away. And it's not an evolution, it's a revolution. So uh -huh. that's how they came. And we've brought them in and out over the years, but since we're celebrating our 10 year, we said, let's bring it on back. Um, so yeah, that was really a fun part of it. And if anybody didn't get a beret or they missed the event, let me know and I'll send you one. But they're a good little way of signaling out who's, you know, who's down, who's down for really trying to do some work here. Uh, one of the things that we did is uh, that I think worked pretty well is that as we got into the table discussions and uh, trying to do the report out, let's see, here we go, shout outs. Um, we wanted to try to see if we could capture some of that because we know it's hard getting information back from the moderators after they've left. They were so excited after doing three rounds of this. And so these were some of the ways in which we were able to actually kind of start to get the content um, the year. There you go. Um, but some really good insights. And I think let's, um, I'll turn it over to, you know, Anne-Marie and Rafi and Omar and things like the people out there that said, okay, what were some of the, 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 the key takeaways that you had? Glenn, oh, Glenn, you came up for the social hour. Yep. <laughs> the important part, right, Glenn? The important part, exactly. <laughs> hey, and Barbara, you were there too. So, you know, I think it was just really interesting to see some of these different, um, you know, this is just a, one paragraph of a very lively discussion. David and I tried our best to go around the room to capture them, and it's noisy and there's a lot going on. So I'm glad that we did this one, David, but we'll be synthesizing this and sending it out to everybody so that you can kind of see some of these things. But I think there's just a lot of really good feedback there. And then we did yeah, a think, session. Yeah, when we, so we recorded and that's off to the, uh, our global video uh, editors, uh, Jamal, you know, absolutely nailed uh, belonging. He was spectacular and yeah, I may have some uh, some blind spots there, but really great stuff. And then I heard tr uh, as we we're taping people, uh, I heard trust uh, quite a bit, and I'm seeing it yeah. here on the Mente too. So people trying to get to that psychologically safe place where you you trust that the the corporate culture is reflective of where you're actually 
uh, add, you know, we're still in this mixed storm for a long time. A lot of the financial institutions and those with closed cultures have made announcements as recently as this week that, you know, uh, senior leadership has to be in five days uh, a week. So, you know, and, and you know, when senior, if you tell a managing partner at a financial institution, or a law firm that they have to be in uh, five days a week, they're they're going to turn to their lieutenants and probably, uh, you know, echo some of that down. So a lot of crazy stuff still <clears throat> in front. Of, and as I'm talking, I'm I'm reading the same screen we all hear. For those the one person who's driving, uh, Jamal, the um, you know people still want to measure um, the uh, the workplace has to be data uh, driven. Comments, uh, Kate. Lister. A lot about AI. I yeah. mean, yeah. everybody wants to know what's the implication of AI. I think that's a good topic. Sure. We saw that we heard that quite a bit at the last two uh, mosh pits, and mm -hmm. uh, it it took over uh, world workplace uh, Europe uh, three three weeks ago, <clears throat> and uh, and 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 baffled a lot of the old line workplace strategists who say, I, I can't believe people aren't concerned with cybersecurity and, and other, you know, IT um, uh, elements to have digital equity, et cetera, et cetera. <sighs> the, the preoccupation was really on AI. The, the, and Kate, uh, the demo we we saw on it, which is a, a, a four minute video that James Waddell led yeah. now is, is pointing to, uh, I can see more than one table in the uh, uh, in a pre-conference get together dedicated to digesting AI. So it's here, get used to it type thing. Yeah. A lot of great, a lot of great stuff here. Anyone else as you read these, if you were there, and it a longer kind of half the hour. I I think we did pretty good this time. <laughs> I don't know how everybody else felt about it, but I, I feel no. like I feel like we we did a good job. Yeah, it was it was oh, yeah. crazy. It was crazy social. And I I don't know how the people like Rafi do it, who's uh, not just sponsoring, but hosting and 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 moving different get togethers. I kind of felt like that on on Wednesday night. I'm, you know, not normally put any schedule together. But the next thing you know, there was a several back to back to backs and uh, had a blast. It was a, a lot of fun. I even missed the wee brother on Wednesday night did you after that meal yeah careful, we had fun we went to that yeah. divey chinese restaurant that you suggested <laughs> and nobody well, got yeah. food poisoning so that was a good thing yeah. <laughs> you, it was you, good you you told me it the was. 75 plus budget was not was not a good idea that we should make sure it's inclusive so i said well looks like chinatown yeah. <laughs> it was fun we all shared and it was a good way just to kind of further keep you know just continue to digest because as you can see here we've captured so much information that it was to Rafi's point the conversations in between you know just really having that continual discussion the part I have to say another part that I really really love is that nobody was talking about should we do hybrid or not you know I mean it was like we moved through that discussion I was so happy and that it's really more around if we're going to do hybrid how do we do it well right um, and one of the tables I was really curious about because there was some good conversation, but you know, Omar and Julia's comp table was really always heated and good. I wonder if you guys had any suggestions or some thoughts from what came forth from your table. Oh, great point. Is it Julia yeah, I'm willing. Do you want to go up? No, go ahead, Julia. Because you're side by side yeah. on my screen. I just think that you're together. Yeah. So. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was just really clear that everybody at the table wanted to uh, break down whatever silos might exist. And I thought it was very interesting, the concept of just a new kind of um, kind of chief workplace and engagement officer that would feed into a chief transformation officer. So that was, you know, so that there's just a way of everybody reporting up to the same place that seems to be what creates the silos in the first place is different reporting structures um it was really interesting that it was everybody was pretty keyed into solving issues for the employee you know so it was very employee centric 
in terms of what everybody's striving to to work toward. And um, let's see, I'm just scanning through my notes here. Yeah. Really yeah, the, the reporting structure is kind of an interesting one. Our our company um, is in seven markets and 12 offices, and we have various parts of the company supporting other parts of the company, like our admin for the Bay Area, or for Denver also covers the Bay Area, and yet the Boston managing director oversees Denver, DC oversees Raleigh, but the admin for DC also oversees Raleigh, and with that mix, it's really helped our company align in terms of lessons learned and help understand like the quality of meetings. You know, one of our Marcom people just moved to Denver who has been in New York. So she's learning all of these things about Denver that she's now transferring some of the best practices from there over to New York and vice versa. And it's really helped spread the culture and have a cohesive culture in the whole company. Yeah, I, I was in that uh, table of uh, was moderated by Omar, and and Kate North was there, and Tracy Hawkins was there, and a few other people. I was too, Rafi. And and and, and and Anne Marie was was in in that table, and we had a very lively, vibrant discussion, and it really highlights, you know, knowing that Tracy came from Twitter, which is just mm -hmm. too autocratic, and then he moved now to, I think Grammarly. Grammarly. Right? Grammarly. And then when she joined that one, she actually uh, were uh, almost like setting the tone of being a real workplace manager, you know. And 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 what I I remember was that because of the respect accorded to the employees, right, and being mindful of co connecting the dots among the stakeholders, that there is really an increasing interest on, on employees to be back at the office. But at the same time, they were accorded the, the respect of you know, working where they are. So actually that was almost like a, a, a use case for what was discussed on Thursday morning mm -hmm. when, when Andrew Mason was talking about that, you know, how to balance the role that leadership plays uh, and, and uh, the role that mid-level people and uh, employees need to play to really create a wholesome environment where people are really enthused to be effective and productive. And I underscore this wherever they are. So no, that, that was my, my major takeaway by in, in that discussion with that was effectively moderated, of course, by Omar. Yeah, I think the I think the big thing for me was just like the idea of like that kept getting repeated of like scaffolding, right? Like if the teams, HR, IT, workplace, facilities, CRE don't work together, the scaffolding doesn't work, right? That support system and structure for the employees doesn't work. And good org design is a huge part of this, but like that scaffolding has to exist. And it's really hard when we're all in our siloed groups and we're not like, you know, the, the drivers become different for the different teams within the company. Um, and I think that was an interesting takeaway for me. It was just like the idea of like that word scaffolding of like the support structure of yeah. what you need for the employees. I think that's, that's huge. And I'm kind of cautious about, um, new technology and adopting too many new things too quickly, but partially because I think we haven't even figured out how to like get some parts of our community to adopt the technology that already exists and integrate to that. So how do we jump to like, AI adoption, right? Like, yes, I'm actively using AI products and studying them and like looking into them, but I've always been a tinkerer and I've always been in like that world, but not everyone in our world, like we still have teams planning spaces on spreadsheets and like we still have teams like, you know, working with like 60 year old BMS systems. Okay, great. So how can we take those people and bring them to like progress doesn't start where everyone else is. Progress starts where you are as a team. So I think we need to think about the different generations of teams we have now and the different generations of spaces, et cetera, and think about how we can help all of them make progress and build better scaffolding. Because um, it's good to discuss new ideas like AI, et cetera, and adopt them. But I think we need to also get the basics in place. And those basics are, Andre and I had coffee on, I think it was Tuesday, whatever, and talked a little bit about that. Like, you know, just getting the basics in place is a huge thing. <laughs> and if you can't get the basics in place, then you're not gonna have a successful scaffolding structure in order to like do anything else later.
And honestly, the basics, getting the basics in place is so hard for HR as things change is, is when we wonder why they're not at the table for strategy. They're, they're often in the back room dealing with like the proverbial, proverbial plumbing. Um, and um, I think that is a challenge and why I think we have to split out those roles. Like we can't assume a, an HR operator is going to be a strategic HR strategist per se. Very different skill sets. Right. Where's where's uh, Kevin located? Anybody who met uh, uh, Lynn's fiance, Lynn ba uh, Baez from Google. Mm -hmm. And say, Kevin, what, what organization is he at? Because he he had some great summary points on kind of what I've heard from uh, Andrea Rob quite a bit in the past. Do they are so burnt out? They've got so much compliance that they have to deal with. Compliance is getting more complicated, not less complicated. Har harassment did not go down during the pandemic, you know. So they're they're preoccupied with with the plumbing. He he said as much. Yeah, I, I think, though, to your point is that, uh, especially if there's been a reduction of force, uh, there's, you know, fewer hands, um, and we've got to have it faster. And as we know, some of these things are big operational platforms that require some heavy lifting. So it is, I think, uh, empathy and passion are still really good pieces to bring forward as we think about how do we you know, begin to execute. I heard a lot about executing on doing hybrid, which was great. One other new theme I started to do is we kind of floated from tables to tables was also the focus on that uh, you, you know, the, to get hybrid white, right, you have to really think about what is your work process and what are the work practices and maybe articulating more of those. Um, and I know many on this call are heavily involved in really thinking about that, uh, that element of it. But I think that was good to kind of get acknowledged and I think the other piece that, you know, we've heard is that, you know, while you're working on hybrid and doing all this, can you also link that to other big initiatives around ESG? You know, how might you begin to think about things, um, you know, coming together in different models that support not just one goal, but all goals? It's funny that you say that, Kate, when I was recently um, overseas and they were as usual, you probably remember, much more concerned with ESG for different reasons, like lack yeah. of space and costly um, commodities and things like that. But um, that connection between hybrid work and the opportunity to use fewer resources is is really very connected and on people's minds, um, maybe less so here, but it's all relative. One other table that I just wanted to see if we could maybe get Arnold. Yo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> His table was on portfolio strategies. And I thought that was really interesting too. What were some of your highlights just to put you on the spot? Well, I think we focused the, um, the conversation or tried to focus the conversation on not looking at traditional ways of discussing, you know, portfolio. Well, I think it was portfolio optimization, you know, but based on the fact that, you know, your portfolio is both physical and virtual these days, um, we need to get out of that mindset that uh, that your portfolio is just a physical uh, asset. And on top of that, depending upon the type of, you know, potential hybrid strategy that your organization is deploying, how does that impact your thinking, you know, about both refocusing the purpose of of the portfolio um, and, uh, you know, how you begin to define it and how you begin to measure it. So, you know, it was a good conversation, uh, you know, for two of the three tables, I, th I thought, which was um, having done the same topic at um, World Workplace, you know, um, in Nashville last year, where I think we had one person at our table um, um, because they thought the topic was a snoozer. Um, we had full tables all three times, but I think, you know, obviously, you know, it depends upon the people who were coming into it, but the first two tables that we had, I thought everybody was, you know, very engaged and, uh, you know, coming up with some, you know, interesting challenges, mm -hmm. not necessarily solutions, but at least challenges. 
I've got to head out to another meeting, but great to see you all. David and I will summarize this and send this out further. Lenny, you need to still share. And yeah, I know. I've been excited to share about, because I, and if you need to go, Kate, okay, it was good to see you. So I don't mean to hold on to you. I saw you earlier anyway. Um, I hosted the table on belonging and I thought what was really interesting that came up and unprompted. And it was really, I, I thought it was, wow, this is great that this is part of the conversation. So there's three table, three, three groups of people that come to your table and every single one of the groups had people, two or three, that talked about the same issue. Now, mind you, at the table, you have people who are in facilities and workplace, real estate, that kind of thing. And the first question we ask at the table is talk about a time where you feel like you don't belong. Well, three or four people mentioned, I don't feel like I belong in my organization. I'm always constantly trying to explain to my manager what I do. I, I, and they're either in legal, they're under HR, they're under pro procurement, they're under different entities. But that fact that, you know, the fact that they don't, they're in an area and in a space where they don't, they don't feel that they belong and they don't have a voice at the table because they're not part of an entity that understands what they do was a very big uh, pain point for them and a very big uh, it's a very big factor when you feel that you don't belong and you don't feel like your superpowers are in a space where it can it can work. And what's also interesting is I also uh, facilitated the table for the chief workplace officer role. And at that table, we had we had architects, real estate, facility management, workplace strategy. We had those folks again. And because the question was, OK, how do we fix hybrid? What do we do about hybrid? How do we work out the hybrid environment for this organization? They were so engaged and excited about it. At the end of that exercise, they said, we finally feel we have a voice at the table. This is what we've been trying to do. We've always wanted to have a voice at the table, but we're not heard. And I thought that was such, for me, it stood out as a huge key takeaway because again, it's part of the things that I've been talking about for a while, um, but it was coming from other people. It, this was the first world workplace or facility fusion where uh, you constantly heard FM putting their voice forward, right? I think they've always wanted that yeah, because yeah. we're all human, right? Of course, we want to be known and, and heard and, and be part of the strategy part. But now, now there's, a, there's a step up going involved. And you saw a lot of that, uh, Lenny. I think, that's, uh, I think that's a major uh, yeah. take, takeaway. Well, when you're trying to redefine what a workplace is and what is the new purpose of an office and how are we going to manage and operate these new spaces, and yet you have the people behind that not at the table in that conversation, it becomes very frustrating for those who are told what to do, but it's not what they know is the right thing to do. Does that make sense? So I could, I could feel it and I could see it. Do you have any discussions about why people thought that happens? Because that happens within our own organization at HOK sometimes we're like, we do this for people, we do this for clients. And when we really connect with a client and they understand what it is we do and work with, you know, people like are at your tables, that's very clear, the value in that. But, but sometimes getting there is so difficult and I, it's not a really difficult concept. So was anybody talking about why they felt people were misunderstanding this whole concept of what it is yeah. we all do. Yeah, and you know, to be very honest, I know it because I live it in my own, in the, in, in, I wear two hats. The other hat that I, that, I, that I do is I'm, you know, the head of workplace, the head of workplace and the head of hybrid in a company um, that is 21 offices around the world. And yet my, my manager is a chief people officer and doesn't care what I do, doesn't understand what I do, doesn't listen to what I do. So I live it and I know it and I understand it. And that was the feedback I got too. It, it's that um, it's difficult to be heard when the space is not open to hearing your perspective. I wish Jamal was at the table because Jamal had a similar experience where he joined a conversation in a group of HR practitioners talking about hybrid. And when he brought in, you know what, these are what we can do from the workplace perspective in terms of re-looking at portfolio strategy, re-looking at how we're going to utilize the office, re-looking at how we uh, uh, how we sustainably make uh, allow uh, employees who are working from home sustainably productive. When we look at from the workplace perspective, he was not heard. He was not only not heard, he was bypassed. Um, and I think that's what it is. It's that 
workplace needs to have its own entity separate from HR, separate from finance, separate from legal and have its own vertical in an organization. Now, this is something that I've been fighting for and I will continue to fight for, but this is, I, 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 I am glad to hear that it's bubbling up so much so that hopefully we will start to create that change. Let, let me add an, a note on this one because on, on, on that uh, workshop that I attended and uh, talk about this, uh, the, the, the emerging role of the workplace officer, uh, there were two things that, that, you know, that was brought up. One was uh, that people, uh, we are all prisoners of the, of the obvious, you know, the, we, have, we are prisoners of the implicit bias. So one is, there is that lack of awareness, uh, despite the fact that we all come from good intentions, people are not really aware. Uh, and, and so first, first point was really the lack of awareness that this, these are real issues, right? And, and secondly, because of that, uh, what, what came out was really the need for training and education, that we need to train almost everybody from the C-level to the mid-level and including the employees so they become really more aware that these are real issues. And then with that discernment, comes commitment to change. And, and at the heart of it, of course, because Susan, uh, Susan Spears was, was in, on, on, uh, in that discussion, he said, you know, at the heart of this is really trust. Trust. Um, and if there is trust, there will be engagement. And if there's engagement, there will be better cooperation and, and making sure that we're all aligned to achieve the same goal and objectives of the company. Yeah, yeah, trust was a something we saw a lot of in the uh, in the notes uh, from Mosh Pit Live. But I think Rafi, you know, when when you and I and our our different verticals uh, sell into a company, we typically notice that there's there's a power broker in the C-suite, and it's it can always be a different title. And and I think inside of a culture. You know, they, they feel that, and I, this is just me throwing it out, so we're spitballing, of course, it's the mush. Um, but I get that feeling that, you know, people are wondering to what extent are you connected to her or him in that spot in the C-suite? Are you just, are you a half a generation away or are you four rungs and in the corner of the organization away from it? That can be part of being heard because they're, you know, that's, I guess politics doesn't sound like a nice word, but that can be the politics is identifying the champion and watch how they're moving the company. I see a couple heads nodding. I'd love to put uh, Andrea on the spot since she's been inside of some big organizations and see, you know, when you know, at, at one of them, you had a pretty progressive champion CEO that was, you know, after improving DNI. And you guys were able to go do it, and you used workplaces, you know, expansion as a way to, to tackle it. Is it is identifying the champion? Is is that part of it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think even in no matter how much power is concentrated at the top or not, um, whether you're a pretty distributed or top down, you still need top leadership, very like founders, CEOs to care. Um, it sounds obvious, but it often is not. Um, it's not backed up, I think, because the, it, you know it's continuing to bring the business case forward about the why. Um, it's amazing in these economic times how quickly like DEI professionals got thrown out the door, or you know, it's it's um, it's still precarious times for strategic HR work, diversity work. So yeah, leadership matters. Um, is that kind of what you're looking for? And I do have a, a comment about like what's coming up related to, to an Autodesk thing that I wanted to share, but sir, yeah, if, did I address your question? You did, go there, share please. Um, yeah, speaking of, I mean, many of you know, David talks about the work when I was at Autodesk. I wasn't there for all that long, but I did have really good, um, 
support from Andrew Adagnos, the CEO. So I've been interviewed for the last several months here and there. Oh, I think I got to go. I get, I'm getting a call, but um, there is a, hold on. Um, I'm getting a call for my husband. Um, there is a uh, New York Times article that's due to come out. It was supposed to be this weekend, but next in the Business Times where it features Andrew and, and my thinking on what the meaning of belonging at work is and how Autodesk really delved into it. Um, going to talk about why this is such a delicate topic in companies. Um, so uh, when that comes out, I'll be sure you guys are um, copied and would love to, um, if it's favorable, and I think it will, will be, it's really a chance for us to highlight this idea of why the CEO is so critical and that work has, has really charged on and Autodesk is doing great work around this, both in workplace and in culture experience design. So they bring psychological safety in through sprints, um, when I got there, I did change the name to diversity and belonging. And then we really delved into the idea of what belonging means, not just in name change. So Jen Miller is the Times reporter is going to um, bring this to the fore. Very cool. Yes. Look forward to that. Yeah, you know, when you look at the CEOs around the Valley and they make statements that they really haven't backed down uh, from, you know, you you know that uh, Apple's going to be about uh, being physically present, you know, in the space, especially if you have a seat in the ring, it's going to be required. And they, they're just not going away from that. One shift is, you know, Google's made much more cost containment comments in the last uh, several months than they typically would do, right? They led the way, I think, for all companies as uh, a progressive benchmark uh, in, in 20. 20 and 2021 during the pandemic calling for, you know, and I, it's, we can't make any, we need more data. It's, it's six months, it's nine months down the road. And while everyone else was trying to kind of say, you know, let's hedge this and get and try to get back to 2019, which we all know now is obviously never, never going to happen. But at the time, a lot of people were lobbying still, I think looking at senior, the most senior leadership and, and how they press release is pretty telling about where the flexibility is going to be uh, in the organization, not just remote first, hybrid first, uh, be present first, but just the, the, the tone, the tonality. Yeah, David, uh, I just make a comment again. <laughs> you know, people keep wondering about how we talk about some microsystems, but that that's exactly it. We had the CEO Scott McNeely was on board full time. Would often come to the executive briefing center and talk about how he had just come in from home, working at home the first half morning or the morning. Uh, uh, Crawford Be Beverage organized the integrated uh, support services under a, a group called Corporate Resources. So as Arnold was talking about, we had the organizational design in place. It made a huge difference in terms of the success that we had. Yeah, senior leadership all the way. But you know that's that's the startup company who are the core five from startup days were able to uh, keep control. Nobody got uh, pushed or or booted by. Uh, uh, senior financial purse strings, right? So from right. VC, from investors to whatnot have you. So they, they they were able to take it through the billion mark, which is pretty we're pretty lucky. rare. Yeah, yeah pretty rare. Um, other stuff, either from the conference or on this uh, 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 thread. I mean, I get the feeling we're going to see a few more progressive twists at conferences, whether it's outside of my core, like Sherm, or whether it's right in the middle like uh, Cornet or IFMA, I think there's going to be a lot more uh, engagement instead of a, you know, a one-way uh, presentation. But again, that's my confirmation bias, speaking out, wanting everything in the world to be a mosh pit. Hey, David, Fred, I wasn't able to be at Facility Fusion. I missed all of you so terribly much, um, but hearing this, this, uh, mosh pit today sounds like it was an enjoyable time i'd like to back up for a second to to comment that was made earlier about why so many more fms are being vocal 
in this theater now and being an FM myself, um, I think part of it is that so much more responsibility has been put on the FM for solving these problems. Um, problems of the workplace that the CEOs don't have anybody else to point to. And so many of us are struggling looking for these answers, having to create them on our own and having a, a round table session, having these feedback sessions finally does give us that voice to communicate with peers and people outside of our industry specific knowledge source that we can get different ideas from. And I think that's a huge part of it and, and such a great job that Workplace Evolutionaries has, has done to bring the FM to the table and share this knowledge and break down that wall and that silo. And I look forward to more of it, I really do. When we were at Workplace Atlanta, it was a lot of the same stuff here just about a month ago. We were in the room with other industry professionals finally and being able to solve different problems. It was. It's a really great experience there, even though it was very tiny. There was only about 75 people at that at that local event, but it was really great to, to have those very close conversations where you could, could get that. I wonder if other people feel the same way in other industries, and if there's not more room and more work that we can do to bring others to the table besides once or twice a year. And to your point, David, you know, these industry-specific conferences, how can we continue to break down the silos and bring in outsiders from those industries to continue this conversation? You know, uh, thoughts on that, anybody? Uh, great to see you all, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say the, the reason we had uh, a, a number of uh, CRA and a couple of uh, HR at the table is, you know, from, from the pit, we sort of you know, bang the drum a little bit more loudly. And great comment from uh, Tracy Hawkins said, I, um, I didn't have any idea that if my had this front of the house, she's living in, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the janitor days, if you will, they just, you know, they, they take care of uh, you know, the air conditioning system, but uh she mentioned in a in a comment to me earlier this morning that she plans on on joining. So I think we are going to get. I think we're seeing a lot more of that cross pollinization. At least that's not a significant example, right? CRE being in, but they're looking for. Even she is looking for solution sets. You know, how do I leverage you know the Fred in my uh, company? to make sure that we're on the same page, the kind of stuff that Lenny talks about all the time, instead of being the one man band, she wants to be able to have these other people, you know, like you're, you're calling for, be able to leverage inside the organization and with, uh, you know, uh, peers out in different industry. But does it start, I wonder, with inviting these other industry professionals to our own professionals. So SHRM, uh, th that's where I think it has to start um, growing. We're really good at talking to ourselves at IFMA and at SHRM and at CRE conferences. We're great at talking to ourselves, but do we, do we have those other industry professionals in there? How can we, and I say we, capital W-E, how can we infect those environments on an intentional basis to generate drive and uh, create change within that is going to benefit everyone. I think that's a bigger question that I'm asking, and maybe we can't solve that right now. But just a yeah. question. But well, yeah, I, I'll, yeah, I'll go. For, I'll go first, Rafi. The the uh, percentage of people that we had from Northern California at this pre conference was uh, was a no brainer. So there were. You know, uh, uh, Sandy used to do all of uh, Adobe's global real estate, said, well, I'll drive down, did a round trip from wine country and uh, just to take part in that first thing. And I think we're doing something similar. Uh, Kate North and I are going to be at it a few weekends doing the administrative groundwork over, you know, this month. But I think in Denver, we'll do something very, very similar. What's happening in conferences that is not just specific to IFMA. The, the price point is really going up um, for the facilitization. So we're gonna look for uh, uh, you know, a terrific 
location for a pre-conference in Denver. This is also a call out. If you have some Denver contacts like Shuley Steele and others, let them know you're going to start seeing it spotlighted for me. But we want to get that. And then because it's so expensive during the conference, everyone's been cut back. All the different um, communities and councils within IFMA. And I, I, I wonder if the same thing will happen in uh, in Cornet uh, a month later for Summit. Will we be able to, you know, I want to grab those people that have, you know, you know, those 20 people that weren't accepted but have great presentations that uh, that we was able to uh, see and fold them in as leaders during a pre-conference day at uh, a gratis facility, maybe even having catering thrown in by a sponsor, what have you. Uh, Rafi, what do you think? No, that, 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 that's great. But I, if you allow me, David, I'd like to share with them an initiative that we are developing uh and this is the core core team david and jamal and Anne marie and surabi you know we we've been talking about this uh, since uh middle of last year and and the goal here is really break the silos uh, uh, among industry organizations so the plan is it was supposed to be february this year but we moved January, it to february yeah. We or have, January this mm -hmm. year, but now I think we move it to January and Marie, right? Yep. 2024. Yep. January 11th or something like that. Whatever that second Thursday is, is the plan. And and the goal is to bring all this organization that are that are involved in CRE, uh, the workplace. Uh, so this will include IFMA, this will include BOMA, the ISP in the life science. It will include the Asian commercial professionals. So all the groups that have has something to do with the built environment, we'll all be invited. And we already secured a venue for that. It is the dome of Juniper, is that Juniper Network, right? The Juniper, Juniper Aspiration Dome, yeah. As yes, Aspiration we, do, we do need to do something about this though, Rafi. We, we do actually have to get going on this because yes, we have the venue. There's a lot to organize around. And it. it's lovely to have an Anne-Marie who keeps on making well, us not yeah. lose sight of the actionable item. It's one thing to have an aspiration and ensuring that we are all there inside the dome. Yeah. All right. Now, just to share that, you know, perspective in response to Fred's question, what are we doing uh, to make this happen? I think that's a great example. Yeah, Elena had a great comment in the uh, the chat, duly noted. Elena, what else is up? You were in San Francisco. We we I, you would think you would you know move an adjacency to your to the northwest and join us at the pit, or are you just too busy? Well, I actually had to fly to Australia on short notice. Um, so literally, it was one of those booking a ticket on Wednesday, being on a flight on Saturday. So just uh, got taken out right around that time. Um, great trip, first in four years for me. Um, but yeah, it was very sad to miss you all. But I, I will have some news soon in terms of my PhD research and, and my book. But what I wanted to, um, to Rafi's point, what I wanted to, to share, and I'm going to type this in the thing. Um, one of the things that I feel like our industry and kind of the broader movements around it, such as sustainability, workplace is lacking is, is precisely what Rafi, what you were describing. There is not really a super body. So the reason I've put Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council is if you are looking at that, take a look at them. So in Australia, they effectively are a super body that all of the typical other organizations actually belong to. So if you imagine there was an organization that the Green Building Council and IFMA and BOMA and in Australian context, um, even um, WWF is part of that and a few governments and a few universities. And the whole idea is that they get together and they set an agenda that they can agree on. And so in Australia, as a result, policy advocacy has been a lot more effective than, than we've had here because here everybody goes to the Hill separately. If my will be there separate to USGBC and separate to BOMA been, for sure. Right? Yeah. And having been in, in policy influence for a long time. That is just a very easy excuse for politicians to say, if you guys can't get yourself organized, we're going to stay out of this thing, right? Versus imagine if whatever the issue is, if we can get together, right, and go together saying this is our agenda. So just as a model, I've um, 
NIBS, National Institute for Building Sciences, I thought could be that because of their setup, but um, they, they, don't, they kind of don't want to, and with Lakeisha gone to, to, to architects. But I think what you're describing, I'm happy to chat more. I've helped set up and accelerate these kinds of um, coalescing, convening um, organizations, because I think that it's just key. Otherwise, everybody's competing for the same space, money, headspace, um, and we just don't get as much done on issues that really matter. Yeah. Well, thank you for the needle, Rafi. And maybe Elena, you and I can have a conversation because somehow I I feel like if uh, I don't drive this Smashing Silos event that it may never happen. So um, I appreciate that you brought it up, Rafi. And it sounds like maybe there's some precedence for this to exist in a, a larger umbrella rather than all of the separate pieces you know, fighting for the same thing. Yeah, you know, set set the bar high, but have your emotions um, lower because at the very least, just getting the different, you know, a hand, it'll be much more than a handful of the leaders from those different organizations that that have it on their calendar already and bring their their people. Yeah. And from that network, then a lot of things can happen informally. Obviously, what Elaine is talking about is the idea of, of, of building towards something that's, that's uh, you know grander and is is box that we can all check and say hey let's make sure that we go to this holding company and let them know uh, how we're shifting our particular conference in context uh, you know date or what have you so it, all of you great ideas um, closing recording thoughts anyone. Uh, there, there wasn't enough talk at the conference on the, on the things that have to do uh, with, with events. I was surprised by that. I thought there would be more um, of, you know, the, the pop-up events, uh, the d dramatic changes in grab-and-go hospitality, uh, the idea of people from uh, the Ritz Four Seasons training uh, coming over to workplace. So, I, you know, I don't... I don't know if anyone else heard uh, any of those uh, types of comments, but it, it seemed like more of a more of a, a brass tack. Let's let's get it done, and and more uh, you know more FM again. Uh, Fred, you would have loved it uh, coming to the front of the, the the table and saying, "I'd like to be a a part of the input more than I've seen in, in past conferences." So that that's kind of my my level my leveling of the week. And as Anne Marie said, there was quite a bit of social. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what everyone else's thoughts were. I, I know every time it's like, oh, we could talk more, more, more. I feel like I was sort of at saturation point by the end of that, you know, three, Kelly. three hour chunk of, of talking in that time, and I, feel like I got a lot um, out of it. And then you know, we were able to just mix amongst each other at the end, especially on the 46th floor of uh, the Hilton. That was pretty rad. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and we got Carl the Fog to join us. That was pretty cool. He doesn't always show up. No, that was definitely a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, let's say, uh, so wrapping big question here, Elena, uh, change management. Yeah, I just thought I would sneak that in if, if people, I didn't want to interrupt, right? But if, if people have insight for me. So I've been working in change, right, for a long time. And, and I've just always been shocked and I'm trying to validate it with this group that even when I've been on project teams that are billing a million dollars a month, there is never anybody responsible for process change. Um, there's people change, there's technology. And so that's been my experience, which is why I've sort of become kind of a little bit of a diagnostician of why change fails. But I just wanted to ask, like, are you aware? I mean, this is potentially one of those professions that we're missing that doesn't even have a name, but it, it, just your experience of if, if you are aware of what people are called that actually professionally do process change, I'd love to hear um, McKesson, McKenzie, Sandhill Road has a bunch of boutique ones that, you know, they're the management consultants that, you know, used to be at Bain and now they're, you know, two to five people hit teams. What, um, what is it called? Um, they're 
I just do it under the generic integral of management consulting. Yeah, yeah, okay. And they they have inside of them um, process teams. You pre absolutely, and the main <clears throat> drivers they go to the you know the CEO or the COO or the uh, the champion is going to be and and just lay out together what is definitely going to get done and happen. And so they get the sign off on, we're going to move towards these process change. And then Michael Grove, who's on this call here, knows it from, you know, a similar, uh, a similar high level. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and he's somebody to, to yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely uh, bug offline. He knows that, that industry a lot better than I certainly do. Mm. Are they called yeah. anything? Like how change managers are called change managers? Are process people called anything or are they just kind of a an ill-defined subset of management consulting? What, what, what was revealing in the discussions, right? That indeed we need to address change. That there's, it's almost like it's clear that change needs to take place. The issue is really who is going to drive it? And when we do an analysis of the key players, whether it's HR or IT or the FM or the CRE, it looks like there seems to be that lack of skill set to be able to, you know, to be able to effectively, effectively drive the conversation. So, one, there is an. Uh, it looks like that's no longer an issue. Change needs to happen and change um, is, is, is really urgent. But the question is, who is going to drive it? Shall we bring in an outside consultant or, or that kind of thing? That is really what is the issue, you know, how to, how to really address that issue, who should be the driver of this. And I think Michael has been at the heart of this discussion. Uh, he probably can give us some, um, better input on how to address this particular challenge. Yeah, well, I'm glad you guys got around to this because I, I think we're going to just keep floating around. A lot of good stuff, by the way. I love the uh, getting the, the different uh, groups together, but it's a slow process. And what really needed, actually, I think, is a is an org design issue. It's it's we need the, the equivalent of the COO in the old days around talent, I'm calling it talent ops for now, but it's basically this idea that you know, you've got to get an alignment between the people who are actually doing the work and the people who are trying to create the P&L result. And if you don't create some kind of P&L commitment to it, that's why HR has no teeth. There's nobody that can say no about how we're using talent. And so we need to convince the CEO levels that they're, they're not going to get it right until they find more harmony in the organization. And it's not going to happen by just doing more, you know, fix it stuff. It's got to happen right at the core of the way you manage the business. And if we don't get to that org design change, which I think we're working on trying to present a really good solution to that, I don't think it's actually going to shift. Well, I think as Michael said, you know, it's an organizational design problem and not, I mean, the process piece of it is a component of the OD piece of it. I mean, I know yeah, when exactly. we talk to the clients about change, you know, we try to put in the perspective of looking at the entire, you know, organizational design and what makes it up. And, you know, the people piece of that is important, the process piece, um, organizational structure and management is critical, you know, to that. So, you know, all those elements are areas that, that we look at when we do a change program. Um, and, you know, getting beyond just the communications piece, which I think most of us here have gone be well beyond. Uh, but I think, you know, too many organizations are stuck on the communications piece and not on the substantive pieces of what it takes to really do the work. I guess what I'm getting at, too, is, is there needs to be an owner, somebody yeah. at the very top of the management that's the owner. And uh, so there needs to be a customer, somebody in that organization that will pull HR together, will pull IT, will start to work about how to do Gen AI, will start to figure out all these, these solutions. And that owner, I think, is the equivalent of the COO. It's the number two person in the company. 